in line right now? Um, looks like right now it's about t- 21. So oh, it'll probably be okay. somewhere we could hit up to 30, but okay, that's cool. usually about 20, it's usually around 25. Right. Okay. Good. Um, all right. So uh, thank you everybody for um, showing up to, for today's lunch and learn. Um, uh, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, one, this is going to be recorded. And once the recording is done, Micah will put it up to our uh, YouTube page that we have started to post a lot of these lunch, all the lunch and learns and the meetings too. Uh, you probably have seen those emails from Micah. Um, so look for another one uh, from her either later today or tomorrow. Um, also, um, if you have any questions uh, during this, uh, you can go ahead and post them into the chat and then um, we'll go ahead and get those, uh, probably hold off on those till the end. Um, but um, today's speaker is Shane Matthews, who is with Esri, and he's going to uh, talk about the Community Maps, Maps program. Okay, go ahead, Shane. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Um, yeah, well, Matt Hone, uh, probably you're an account manager for many of you, Uh, was on a call with me recently with the city of Des Moines. And he asked me after that call if I'd be interested in doing a lunch and learn session. And yes, of course. Um, So I do appreciate Matt and Micah for organizing and Josh also um, for the opportunity. And I speak to a lot of folks all over the country uh, during any, you know, routine week. And so two subjects have been coming up and i thought we could talk about those just for a minute um temperatures and weather okay is a big conversation piece and also gas prices so um josh since you're leading this um what are what are uh i don't know what's the gas prices right now in the ames area or throughout the uh the state of iowa right now What's the um, you guys are paying? Well, I saw 419 on my way in the work today. Okay. Okay. So, and that's for like a mid range octane, some average. Um, yeah, it's the only one that was on the sign. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, one choice. So, we, you know, depending on what you put in your car, um, I live in Denver. Okay. Outside of Denver, I'm at 8,000 feet in the mountains west of uh, the city. We're paying, we always pay more for stuff because we're a little little more rural, but um, Evergreen area where I live is paying 319 to 469, okay? And I remember when I was in like high school and even in, well, in high school, I would never fill my car up. I would put in like, I'm dating myself. I would put in like five bucks and I would get anywhere. I could get to work and to school on five bucks a week. That was in the mid eighties. So you know, we're paying like 89 cents a gallon, right? So that's, I don't think I filled my car up until I got a job. Like I worked for National Geographic. I can finally fill my car up. Um, and I do fill my car up at Esri. Uh, so those days are over. Um, so temperatures is another thing and weather. What's happening in Ames today? What's the forecast for the week? Is it is it warming up? Are there flowers blooming? What's happening? Yeah, it's not sunny today. Yeah. Okay. About sixty-five. Okay. Allergies are bad because of blooms. So. Yes. Yes, man. My my allergies started kicking in around mid-April, and uh, we'll be locked in through June probably. So the the weather here in Colorado, I don't know if any of you have been out here before, but between the months of March and the end of May, it's really difficult to dress yourself because any any given day we could have a, a a wide range of temperature swings, weather. Like today, it's going to be 70, quite nice. And to Josh's point, everything's leafing out. You know, we're about three weeks behind Denver here, but the pollen's starting. Things are getting kind of, you know, hazy. And tomorrow, we're expecting 79 degrees, right? That's like super warm for us. Um, and Friday, 14 inches of snow. It's nuts. And so, and then, and then on Saturday, another two. So 
16 by Sunday morning. Um, anyway, man, enough of that. I just wanted to have a little icebreaker and chat. A little bit. So um, we're going to go through a, a kind of a broad view, a um, high level overview of the program. And I know Josh is, is looking at the chat window. Um, I, I don't look at the chat window when I'm presenting. But if there's questions, throw them in there. And um, I also don't mind if there's something that you want to to interject or or have clarified, or a question. If you want to stop me, um, that's that's perfectly fine too. Um, I'm real laid back about this stuff, and I like to give informal discussions like this. So uh, feel free to chime in. Um, so contributing to either community maps or the living atlas it just means that you're enriching the collection the collection of maps and applications and data uh, throughout the living atlas but i, I want to just take pause here for a moment and and make sure we understand what the differences are between community maps and living atlas um, there's a lot of participation in the state of iowa for the community map program and a quick search on the living atlas there's people nominating items and so the process is different so when you contribute your authoritative data you're asking the community maps team to include this data in esri's base maps and other services and these other services might be like a geocoding service if you're if you're if you're supplying addresses to us so and this means that everyone can see your data in the esri services and 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 not use it, but uh, have it as a background, as a, as a vector tile in the base map environment. But when you contribute to the Living Atlas, you're nominating an item from ArcGIS Online. You're nominating an item through the Living Atlas curators, and you're working with them to review and accept the item into the collection of the Living Atlas content. So the Living Atlas is where things have been vetted and are curated and are, you know, authoritative, the, the best available data for an item, a, a certain a certain topic. OK, so this makes it easier for the casual the GIS community, you know, to discover your content and use it in their work. So, I mean, for example, the Iowa DNR. Uh, they contribute to the Living Atlas and they contribute to the Community Match Program. So they may be giving us, my team, they may be giving us local parks and open spaces and the boundaries for these for these assets throughout the state. But they also might have ecological data or some type of conservation data. Um, I don't know, waterfowl migration, could be anything, land use. Um, they can share that with the Living Atlas, and uh, people can discover that and learn about that and use that. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure we understand the differences uh, here before we get into this. Um, some quick backstory uh, for the program. We launched um, ArcGIS Online some time ago, and we started with a public-facing base map. And I think all we had at that time little before my time <clears throat> at Esri, I've been there 11 years now, we had a topo and a street style. And then we had the World Imagery Service. And we began hearing from people. You know, we began hearing things like, hey, uh, my city has better building footprints and a better park layer than what you're showing. And our county has, you know, people were saying our county, we have higher resolution and a more contemporary imagery set than what you're serving. And so these conversations evolved. Uh, the GIS community began suggesting that they share their map layers with us and you know their imagery in order to better reflect their communities. They began asking us to host their map data online in order to improve ESRI's foundational services because many of these folks, local governments, uh, universities, uh, were using these base maps and their web applications and their web maps and incorporating a more accurate base map uh, would improve these information products they created and also help accomplish them 
uh, you know, help them accomplish their daily GIS work, the tasks that they do. So we formalized a program uh, called the Community Map Program, and this was a way that we could support our customers and our users, and really everyone uh, who is is using uh, the base maps. So I thought we'd go through a few of the, the big areas, um, sharing workflows and some of the things that are available uh, for, to you as, as a contributing organization. Um, so the sharing workflows, um, we have, we started out with just a set of data prep tools and we made it hard. Uh, we used to require local government information model schema and we used to require that folks give us everything, not just one or two layers, but give us everything. And so we immediately threw up a bunch of roadblocks and made it difficult. And we've taken a lot of lumps over the years and we, we appreciate it because we wanna make this easy. Right now, um, it's as easy as it ever has been to step in and, and share your map data with us. And so there's three ways in which to do that. Um, you can share your information by just providing feedback, okay? Tell us what's wrong. Yeah, send us uh, some corrections in form of some, some statements. That's the simplest way to tell us about incorrect or missing features. Uh, you do not need to log on to um, ArcGIS Online. This is a, um, I'm gonna launch this. This is a public facing editable web map that uh, anyone can use to talk about things they're seeing on the base maps that are incorrect. So this is an opportunity to provide feedback for not only the base maps, but also um, for getting uh, errors and in, in geocoding returns, address, bad addresses. You can speak with the, cur the curators for the address, the geocoding team, and you know, make, make something happen. Um, you can provide feedback on any of, of, of the vector tiles. Uh, there's one vector tile, there's just different style files. So you can comment on base map stuff. And you can also comment on imagery, okay? So if we launch this map, uh, this is gonna launch the new map viewer. I don't know how many of you are using the new map viewer. I find it hard to find things in this, even as a, an employee and a cartographer, but I'm getting used to it. Uh, so this is what the environment looks like. Uh, you'll see open and closed issues. You'll see green for issues that have been um, resolved. And you'll see um, issues that are ongoing that are being worked on. And so um, get into the midsection here and you know, you'll see a few comments. Um, I'll let this draw and I'll show you what one might look like. Uh, this is going to pop up. Yeah, so you know we have a we have a you know a, a comment here that just talks about you know what what the problem is and which map is 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 uh, affected and it's the city limit line and you know, they need to change that. And so that's a very effective way to draw a circle around something, tell us what's wrong, um, go into some detail, uh, you know, put yourself in the shoes of the reviewer and the first person who's going to be correcting that error. And, and try to make it easy for them. Uh, but you can make comments again for the tiled files, the base maps, the imagery and the geocoding service. Um, and, and Josh and I were just talking about the edit features option, which is a, a web application. It's called the Community Maps Editor app. And I'll show you what it looks like. Let's see, we're gonna move over here. Um, this is an application that allows um, people to um, go in and digitize features and edit features. Okay, uh, it's a web it's a web app that um, enables anyone to sort of edit, um, add detailed features for universities, uh, schools, parks, landmarks, and special areas of interest. Um, and you would join this group 
just uh, you need a um, ArcGIS Online a public account would be fine. Uh, that's sort of how we vet it, um, just to make sure that people who are engaged with the application are the ones, uh, the the platform are the ones who are, um, you know, editing this and and coming to this. Um, so I have this open on the city of Yakima, and just a quick story about the city of Yakima. They've been contributors uh, for imagery and ba referential base map data for, for many years. Uh, they would probably be considered early adopters. Maybe 2011, they began working with us, and they, they were lacking uh, information for their K through 12 schools uh, throughout the, the the city and it wasn't a big problem for them they don't manage these areas but uh they they do define the community and they do have you know assets they do have events on on these campuses some of these are community colleges some of these are k through 12 schools uh this i believe is a is a middle school and so the the imagery in this region on the world imagery service for Esri is, is super good. It's because they're giving it to us. It's sub uh, meter resolution. So they're, they're able to use some of the drawing tools in this application and create features that they don't have in their GIS assets. Okay. So for, you know, local governments or universities, especially universities we find uh, have a hard time uh, collecting GIS, they've got CAD drawings. Uh, CAD's a problem for many to convert. And it's super head scratching stuff, and no no CAD file is created equal. Okay, so there's no set of instructions that you know you can do that makes that converts through GIS perfectly, and so it's a headache. And so many people, you know, they'll convert what they can, they'll create what they can. Maybe set up some services and 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 share those, but for Yakima, they digitized. Uh, they had an intern come in, intern and students, great resources for anyone, and they're eager to get their hands into the work. And so, this person digitized over sixteen unique, sixteen thousand unique features across the entire city, and. They have this these assets, and so they can go into this app, and they can download what they've digitized. Okay, they can download these in CSV format. They can download these in shape files, geodatabases, KMLs. These are all GIS, you know, formats um, that can be downloaded, and then you can add these to your existing GIS or as you build your GIS. And once you have these in your GIS. Uh, the opportunity is is then to enrich that content to better attribute that data and so after a while you know all of a sudden you have the university or the local government who might have been struggling you know ha has a working asset a contemporary set of gis data uh, that they can that they can use and so um congratulations to yakima that's a lot of work um so sharing data, um, many of you are doing this now. Um, it's really the best way to get complex or many authoritative features added uh, to the base map. And we do require an ArcGIS Online account. Um, it can be an organizational login. That's the best way to do it. If you use your personal login and you leave the city or the school one day, you know, how is someone going to get back in there and pick up the torch, keep the base maps and the imagery uh, contemporary? So whenever possible, you know, use your Org your ArcGIS Online account. So anyone who's engaging with the contributor app that we'll look at here in just a few minutes uh, can have access to that. They can change the layer they're registered for. They can submit services and file geodatabases uh, in order to um, update uh, the map. And so um, the way you engage with that is you use the community app to register for the program and to contribute your content. And we'll look at that here in a minute. You can also review accepted layers tabs. You can prepare your layers and then send them to us uh, through uh, the app. 
we'll get down to that here in a little bit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what can be contributed to um, the Community Maps program. Base maps, obviously, uh, referential content is, is the big uh, attraction, certainly. Um, you can, your organization map layers are added to a suite of ready to use base maps in ArcGIS Online. These are also avail available in Pro. Um, we're incorporating um, data from a variety of, of sources, commercial and community. And we're producing a wide variety of multi-scale online base maps. They serve as a foundation for any GIS task. Um, as many of you know, the, the vector tiles offer a variety of different styles. You can see a few of them here. Um, and that is nice because you can tailor these base maps to fit any audience or project. If you don't like the look of, of any of the base maps, and that's fine, or you want to modify or create a new style, um, we have an ArcGIS vector tile editor. And that's a whole different meeting right there, but it's really um, a good opportunity to quickly uh, highlight buildings uh, or any type of features that you want to highlight, or if you want to just play around with uh, a new style that speaks to your campus or your city, um, it's kind of fun to play with. Um, since we're talking about uh, referential base maps. I want to just get into the roads here a little bit. Um, I want to talk about that. A lot of folks, uh, local governments, uh, like organizations, uh, universities, large and small, they they want to give us road data, which is great. Um, but let's you know, roads are tough because. A lot of people assume that there's problems with the roads. Uh, I'll get a call from someone in the state of Washington, and they said, hey, uh, I want to give you our roads. And I'll ask them a question, it's like, are there problems with the roads? And they're like, I don't know, but Google has them wrong. Okay, um, we may not have them wrong. Um, so what I'm what I'm driving at here is, we're in the business of improving the base maps. And so the, the state of New Jersey wanted to give us roads and we started asking them some questions or are there any problems with the roads? Like, no, we've gone over every major state highway and, you know, arterial and the state and they match our roads perfectly. It's like, great. Why do you want to give us these roads? I know you're proud of them, but it's not going to be a value add. So let's just move on. So, you know, here is our center line um, data provider, H-E-R-E, -E, that used to be Navtech. And so they've improved a lot over the past few years. And in addition to these improvements, um, we've increased our update frequency with them. It's eight times a year. And improvements to here centerline content, coupled with an increased update frequency for the vector tiles, we're releasing updates, refreshing the vector tile environment every three weeks on our end. So this means that, you know, we've, we've adopted a high level, a high standard for accepting community-based roads and centerline content. So I want you, if you're considering giving us roads, um, before you decide to do that, carefully examine the existing content reflected in the world topographic map and the streets base map for your area of interest. And, and verify that the centerline data contribution will, you know, offer features that are not already on the map. And if you do find a handful of needed changes or even a dozen, even several dozen, you know, just consider this as input through the base map and geocoding feedback service. Um, your feedback through that method will likely be visible on the base map faster than if you provide us with an entire layer, okay, that contains only a few changes. We have to go find those. And if you do decide to contribute roads, you know, carefully apply 
you know, your queries within the downloadable data prep tool or within the service delivery dialog boxes. And we'll look at that in a few minutes. You must properly classify features, including highway shields and ramps, if you have them. Okay. One of the biggest reasons for rejecting contributor center lines is when feature classifications and attributions are not as complete as our as our commercial provider. Okay. Most contributors find it helpful to understand how we evaluate workflows, uh, the, the data evaluation workflow for roads. So I want to step through that for a minute. Um, our contributors pre-process that centerline data. That's you. Okay, data prep tools or service deliveries, and they make a contribution. We receive it, and then we use a variety of geoprocessing tools uh, to compare what you sent us against what we already have. And this may be comparing our newest contribution against what you sent us during your previous contribution. Um, our comparison process helps us identify and visualize missing or new geometry or any attribute differences in the layer that you provided, okay? Usually we find differences, almost always. And so when this happens, we have to evaluate that. We have to determine if the existing centerline features that, that are already in our world database would benefit from an update, okay? So we may update the existing centerline layer with the contributors layer or area of interest by completely replacing the entire uh, layer with new data. Uh, when this happens, we replace the older layer with the newer layer. We may update a subset of the existing centerline layer by adding or removing features or by editing features if it's faster. Uh, when this happens, you know, we supplement instead of replace. We supplement the older layer by appending pieces from the newer layer. And so we also may choose not to update the existing centerline layer if we believe that the new layer is the same or inferior to the existing layer. And so this means we're not going to replace or supplement the current content. So, you know, we, we continue processing the center lines from there or other layers and we complete our processing workflow. And so, you know, I guess there's three more things I can say about this before we move on, but it is important. Um, best practices for contributing center lines. Okay. Um, my advice um, would be to carefully apply selection queries when using the data prep tools or the service delivery parameters. You can not only you can provide your roads as services, and we'll talk about why that's popular in a few minutes. But you know, remember that these queries are used to determine road symbology in the base map. So be careful with queries and especially careful when using these things and, or, and like operators. Uh, they can really be kind of you know, difficult if you're not careful. The query results may incorrectly apply a symbol to some of your features. And this is gonna result in the base map reflecting a, a wrong symbology for a road. A road appearing as a highway, for example, a highway off ramp instead of a local road. That could happen. Um, you know, define your road center lines, highway type, and road attribution. This is critical, okay, for naming and, and placement of road shields. So be sure that the SQL parameters um, define shield symbols and, and ramps appropriately. Um, Road classifications, uh, missing classifications create situations where the map symbology can become inconsistent. So be sure to classify all the roads so that roads logically connect. For instance, freeways and highways, local roads should be classified so they appear this way on the map. And finally, you know, um, center lines provided by two different communities may not match at the respective AOI, the area of interest borders. So this can be difficult to avoid as, as you prepare your data. And we review all of this. We review the visual connectivity along the borders to compare features and symbology. And we'll fix the geometry if there's obvious issues. 
um, contributors can help by uh, reviewing these edges and ensuring the road classifications in their databases don't subtly change compared to a neighboring area. And we also don't publish content um, that we've given that the communities out there have given us unless they have um, satisfied a um, you know a review. Uh, we offer a link to a uh, pre-cached preliminary you know cache review to make sure that you're happy with not only your roads but everything you've given us. Uh, buildings are labeled correctly and referential content is is rendering properly. And so there's a there's an opportunity to to catch these road errors uh, there too. Um, yeah, so we're going to move on. I just wanted to talk about roads for a second because it's a it's a sticking point with our production team. We want to support you all, but we need your help in making sure that you're providing the, the best set of center lines that you possibly can. Okay, community imagery. Um, so organizations, and many of you are doing this now, uh, are enhancing imagery um, on ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online by contributing, you know, more recent contemporary imagery, sub-meter resolution imagery. And so all the imagery that we host um, uses the best available data from both commercial and community uh, sources uh, to, you know, produce a, a, a better comprehensive imagery layer of the world. Um, and so a good way, if you're an organization, and we're gonna, we're gonna throw Josh a bone here, it's Iowa State here. This is beautiful imagery, this is great. And anyone who is interested in digitizing um, stuff, features in the editor app, uh, will find the process much better if your imagery is up to the task. And so, uh, this is an imagery, I call it an imagery status map. Uh, so if you were an organization out there, school, if you're a local gov or some like organization, you, you, you've been flying imagery. Many local governments are flying imagery pretty consistently or they're hiring a third party. Um, some are doing it in odd and even years, every two or three years. Uh, some folks are doing leaf on, leaf off, aerial captures. Whatever the case may be, if you feel that the World Imagery Service for your area of interest is is not quite as good as, as you'd like, and you have the rights to distribute imagery to us, you might want to think about doing that. Um, the imagery is the, the most popular service that people hit um, billions annually. I think we even hit... <clears throat> a trillion or more during COVID. People were looking for test sites. People were looking for food banks and services. And so we we saw a lot of, of tile requests for imagery. And <clears throat> I think this is very attractive for anyone who, you know, wants to offload that. I mean, storing imagery and serving imagery locally uh, does come at a cost uh, infrastructure uh, and labor. And so folks who are sharing imagery with us um, can free up that that uh, expense and can free up their servers. Uh, we're hosting community imagery on Amazon commercial cloud-based systems and they're always available, okay? So if you're, uh, <clears throat> if you are a, a GIS manager who has a set of imagery, you're not sure if it's, better than what we're serving, you can use this map. You can go into some of these uh, community scales and you can find out who's who's given us this. Where's it coming from? So Ames, 2019, uh, great resolution. I mean, you know, this is really good stuff. And so the city of Ames is giving us this every, every couple of years. Um, the adjacent community, certainly the university is, is benefiting from that in, in some ways. And so <clears throat> we we like to update community imagery every three years. Uh, we feel like after three years, maybe if we don't get something from you, um, you know, maybe we we might consider just going back to the commercial content. We'll, we'll flip it back. It may be more accurate at that point. 
you know, finished construction zones and things that we know have taken place in the past uh, might be reflected in a uh, Microsoft product, for example. <clears throat> so every three years, we like that updated. Um, so about two years ago, um, the geocoding team at Esri, um, sorry, a little screen management here, get my pretty images up here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the these are allergies, right? So the geocoding team came to us and said, hey, we 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 see that the community maps program is is robust. It's you know over 10 years, it's successful. Um, it's people are using this, and you know it's improving the base maps. It's, there's no doubt. And so they wanted to see if they could use the program to uh, sort of broker um, address points, points and polygons. Maybe distance markers would be good. And so um, you can uh, submit your addresses in a file geo database format and work with our curator, uh, Fong, on the geocoding team, and she's going to help you out. She's going to help you understand um, how to better attribute your data so that you can enjoy a better, you know, experience. Um, we're, we're including addresses uh, from, from, you know, commercial and community uh, folks. Um, many local governments and like organizations are leveraging the uh, ArcGIS platform to support their next gen 911. And so many find this to be quite useful, especially with incorporating some of these newer neighborhoods. Okay, it, it, it's happening everywhere, these new subdivisions. Many of these are gated. <clears throat> so after your plat's finished, you know, these these commercial vendors, they, they don't have access to this information as quickly. It takes a while for them to to get that and to incorporate that and to 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 sell that, to to update people who are paying for that service. And many local governments are finding it very simple to just give us their address points. We'll put them in. And uh, I think they're, you know, you could speak with their the curator uh, specifically, um, but I think they're updating the geocoding system quarterly. I think they'd like to do it more frequently. Um, I can't speak a lot about the requirements and criteria because it's kind of out of my wheelhouse. I'm just a math guy, but I can tell you that um, I think Story County has come in with that. And they may have been a county that didn't quite meet the criteria. They were struggling struggling a little bit <clears throat> with some of the attributions that, that the geocoding team requires. So what do they do? They get on the phone, they talk about it, and they get it done. And so Story came back. I think it was Story. Um, but they came back and they had fixed everything. It wasn't a big thing. They just had to attribute a few fields differently. So the schema could be, you know, recognized and used in, in the geocoding system. And, you know, they're off and running. They're getting better returns. Uh, first responders are able to get to where they need to be. The pizza guy can get to where he needs to be. You know, everyone's pretty happy with this. And we've we've updated, you know, over 20 million unique addresses. And I don't know, it seems kind of interesting to me. That, that's a lot. Um, I know there's, I mean, a half a million, you know, addresses in, in a larger city, but most of the folks who are giving us, the, the thousand or so organizations who are working with us are the folks who are serving us these, these address points. And um, so I think you know, on that level, 20 million is is pretty, pretty good. Um, and lastly, organizations um, can contribute um, elevation and bathymetry. Um, they can enhance the elevation layers in ArcGIS Online by contributing uh, high resolution elevation or bathymetric data. Um, this program uses the best data sources to enhance these comp you know, comprehensive elevation layers and tools that we offer. 
Um, and they also enable, these layers also enable you uh, to do better analysis, to create 2D and 3D visualizations across the platform. I know Arthur Crawford's been with your group. I, I watched his uh, lunch and learn, learn and lunch session uh, on YouTube the other day. Josh had mentioned uh, your guys recording these. I saw those and uh, <clears throat> enjoyed Arthur's session. Okay, so um, let's move on. Well, let's just, this is another uh, elevation uh, map that you can interact with. Uh, you can click on this map and you can find out uh, what might have been there you can find out what type of elevation content is being served in that area. Now, th this, you know, a, a lot of people want to give us elevation data. They may not realize that um, domestically here in the U.S., um, we do aggregate our elevation models, our DIMMs, <clears throat> excuse me, directly from the USGS. In, in many, many uh, GIS shops, local govs are aggregating that routinely up to the, the three debt program. We go in there uh, on some routine <clears throat> and update um, our hill shades and other services uh, with that content. Uh, but other countries that uh, don't aggregate, um, they find that to be a nice opportunity to get their things in. Um, so if you are contributing to the three debt program, uh, you don't need to give us your imagery or your uh, elevation. If you aren't, you, you might consider doing that and we can get that into our hill shades. And, you know, we have a nice multi-directional hill shade that we're using these days for the topographic maps and others, and they're really nice. Um, accepted layers. Um, that is a good topic that we should touch on here. Um, this list provides a, a comprehensive overview of the data the referential data that we accept in our program. Um, contributed data, it will enrich space maps used across the whole platform. Uh, they're hosted on ArcGIS Online for free as part of the living atlas of the world. Um, you can use this information to determine which base map layers that you can enrich, okay? Uh, if you have a better layer, it's for owner parcels. We should talk. If you feel like you have information that would improve the local park coverage, and we should be talking. Um, you can prepare, then provide your authoritative layers to enrich the base maps. Um, or for select layers, you can use the Community Maps Editor app to directly edit large skills features right into the base maps as well. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just take a look at this here a little deeper. Let's see. Let this come up here. This is a nice resource. Uh, many people have referential content they feel that would improve things, um, certainly. And so this gives you a list. Uh, we have addresses. We mentioned those a few minutes ago, the distance markers and point address. And you can, you know, access this information. You can find out you know, how we are describing that layer, um, building footprints. You can, you know, this this gives you an idea of how we are defining any, any layer. It gives you labeling options. It'll give you some feature types. It'll provide some geometry for you. It would even give you an idea of what tool to use. If you're using data prep tools, if you're supplying content in a file geo database format, it'll point you to the right tool. And this optional stuff, if you're looking to provide um, Z value data, um, you know, you can give us information about that too. And that can be done through the parameters, definitions and things like that, that we'll, we'll look at here in a few minutes, but great resource. Um, the, the things about roads that, that I talked to at, at great length, um, you can also find here um, this will give you uh, this, the same information that I reviewed with you about roads, <clears throat> and it's nice and handy. Um, you could download that as a PDF, and you could bookmark that for reference if you're a centerline 
<clears throat> provider. Okay, we're good with that. Um, so um, preparing your contribution, I've talked about it throughout this presentation. There's a couple different ways to do it. You can use the geoprocessing tools. Uh, these are part of the, the data prep tools that we've had in place since the, since the beginning. Um, many of you have used these. Um, maybe you've commented on these. I don't like them. Or, hey, could you make this work better? Um, you know, this is not my day job. I just want a new base map and let's make it easy. So we've had four versions of the data uh, prep tools. And right now they're, they're super easy. They're very lightweight. Um, one of the big things about the data prep tools we kept hearing about from our contributors who are using them is I don't remember what I did. You know, it's been a year. You know, uh, some people are, you know, a year is usually a good cadence. More progressive communities are, are hitting, you know, a, a update cycle in, with higher frequencies. Um, some every month, you know, and maybe if you're that progressive, you should be looking at services. But, you know, if one of the big things we've changed is we've included a parameter file uh, for the file geodatabase users. So you can go in, even if you were the operator last year, you can go in and see how you set it up. It'll save you tons of time. Um, it'll help you and it'll help not only you, but if you leave the organization, uh, the person who's carrying the torch for the base map program, they're going to appreciate it because they're going to say, oh, okay, this is how they attributed the roads, this is how they attributed this and that. Easy. You know, connect the dots, submit. Right? So, you know, services are another way. And, you know, I like them because our contributors like them. Uh, the services came up. We were, we were mapping Big Ten schools. We decided to map Big Ten schools. Not sure why. My boss is a Big Ten guy, so maybe you know, maybe that's the reason. But we thought that um, these Big Ten schools would have robust GIS. Well, they, you know, not all of them do. Uh, they suffer from the same thing that you know smaller institutions do. They have a lack of aggregated GIS. They have CAD. They can't convert. You know, whatever. Um, so. We got to Michigan State and they're like, hey, we've been looking at the program for a number of years. We love it. We think we could benefit from it. We certainly see the value. We have a lot of information products that are public facing that would be improved by, you know, consuming a, a better foundation, better base map, get our students to the bike racks, whatever, find the places to eat. But we don't have the bandwidth. <clears throat> we have a resource issue. And that's true in local governments too. I know a lot of one person shops, a lot of them. And so that's why I feel the community base map program is serving these smaller shops the best because if you just invest some time to set up your services one time, you know, we'll go in and we get them on a, a six month cycle. So you can set up your building footprints, you can set up your trees, your parks, your aren't your your parcels, your roads, and we'll go in and get them. And it's like setting it up one time. And as long as these services remain stable and contemporary, um, you really shouldn't have to do much. You know, maybe go in there and add add a service if you have a, a new um, you know sidewalk layer, for example. You know, whatever whatever that case, whatever it may be, but. The, the services really do cut down on the opportunity to not have to significantly modify your schema, okay? And it's popular because it's easy. Um, let me just show you what this looks like. Um, this is my account. Your account looks just like this, but you do not have an admin label here. So when you register your organization, you just provide information on these fields and you go down here and you pick uh, the types of layers that you feel that you're managing that would improve the base maps. And so um, 
all of these are supported as services except addresses and we'll see where they go with that um <clears throat> you know we're not providing too much support on addresses because we don't understand what they want they're using the community maps as a conduit it's been quite successful as i've pointed out but uh they haven't offered this as a service um, they've got data dictionaries that can help you understand how to attribute stuff but that's not why i'm here i want to show you how to set up quickly set up a service um okay so this these this is a building footprint service from salt lake county why not we're going to grab it i'm going to copy this and i'm going to go to my a new contribution <clears throat> all of the check boxes that you see here are aggregated into this list of layers and so on the left you have the list of layers that you've registered for and on the right you have your your formats uh, some people may not have everything as a service maybe they've got building footprints as a service but they don't have their local parks so what i'm driving at here is that you can submit um, different types of formats you can submit the file geo database and you commit you can also um, submit services so services um, are super nice because um, it's sort of a portal into the data and um, you can share things through your arcgs online account this is mine um, you can see i've got some public facing things here and some private stuff but anything publicly facing you can deliver your services right through arcgs online the um county of salt lake and many just provide rest points to us and if you pop in the rest point and click ok here if the service is valid it'll recognize it as a service it'll recognize what what the service is it's building footprints it's going to talk about a frequency and if you click this window you can begin attributing your building layer for example okay um if you click this off um, this gives you the option to just take the generic general category of buildings just that gray color nothing is is symbolized or you can go and symbolize your your buildings by color if you want i'm not a big fan of that there's no legend on the base maps so what does it matter and the buildings just give really good context to the map and so I, I, they are useful but I don't think that, um, you know, a rainbow of colors in, you know, downtown area for uh, <clears throat> airports and, you know, hotels and hospitality and government buildings, it can be, it can be a lot, especially if there's a lot of different types of buildings in, in a central business district, it becomes visually, you know, hard. And when you begin putting operational layers, you're trying to do some work, it's not it's not so nice to look at yes i'm a map snob um but just how it is so you can you can define heights you can do anything you want uh you, you can do the same thing in a file geo database you can attribute your data here you can go in and view that selection once you're finished we'll see how quickly this renders <clears throat> but just to catch any uh glaring mistakes you can look at your services through the window here. And so these are all the buildings for Salt Lake County. And I don't know if we'll wait for this, but you can see the pink buildings sort of coming in. Um, dare I click another? Yeah, it's just a little bit slow here today. Uh, they're starting to come in <clears throat> anyway you can view uh, your data uh, there and so the services are, are certainly quite simple um, many have chosen that route they're happy to not uh, pick up the data prep tools and you know even if you need to use them uh, they're they're pretty lightweight pretty easy to use and you know we don't we don't have too many issues with um, with those these days 
Um, when everything's quiet, we know it's working, right? Um, so to register your organization, um, I can show you what that looks like. Go to my admin view here. Uh, I got the city of Ames right here. Um, our friend Ben and Lisa, maybe you know them, maybe they're on the call. Um, they're registered for the following layers. And you can, when you register, you want to provide only this and the registered layers that you feel that will make improvements to the base maps. And you can see the next pool for your services would be listed here. And um, organization name and citation name, many use the same. That's a good practice. Um, many people are confused as to what this is. What this is, if you see down here, there's this dynamic attribution. You'll see City of Ames, County of Story, Iowa DNR. All of these people are providing information in this tile. And so when you get down to these community scales, 9K, 18K, and, and beyond, um, the City of Ames will come up as the person or group who is supplying content. Now, some people like to put in their name, Lisa Mott, okay? Not everyone knows who Lisa is. Can she be trusted? Probably, but it'd be better to see an authoritative city name here or a county name just to make it, you know, feel good, okay? So that's what that is. Um, yeah, and so, you know, point of contacts are, are good, uh, a way that we can get in touch with you. So if we, we can look as, as an admin, we can look at the contributions for AIMS. We can see that these are uh, folks who are, you know, routinely making updates. Um, and let's see if they're doing any services. Yes, all their services are listed here. And the frequency in which we go and get that stuff is also there. We send automated emails out. So it's not like you're in this, you know, this black hole. We'll let you know, hey, in two weeks, we're going to grab your building footprints, your parks, your owner parcels. You know, if you need to do anything with your services, it'd be a good time to do that. Make sure they're up to date and um, ready to go. So um, let's have a look. Iowa. A lot of organizations. Uh, Des Moines. Um, Story County, uh, DNR, Iowa Flood Center. They give us stream gauges, right? Lynn County, Dallas County, Cedar, uh, Cedar Rapid or uh, Cedar Falls, excuse me, um, Franklin, Waterloo. Lots of lots of folks um, in Iowa are coming to this. Maybe some of you were online. Um, maybe we've spoken before, but um, there's. There's a lot going on in the in the midsection here, and so this is a just to to kind of wrap it up. This is just a a view of um you know what's going on. These are all published contributors throughout the world. Um, it's pretty west focused, uh, just because you know that's where the program started. But uh, things like the editor app and the the, the feedback loop have given folks. Uh, in the Middle East and India and Africa uh, opportunities to get their stuff in. And so we've been seeing, you know, a lot of uptake in Eastern, Western Europe, uh, Middle East. Um, you can go into um, the U.S. and the Iowa region and find out, you know, who's doing what. This is a public base map. Um, you can simply click on a an icon and it'll tell you who it is. Um, some of these, yeah, so some of these are editor app people. They've digitized a park or something. You can just see, you know, who's doing what. And so anyway, and at the bottom here, uh, there's some additional resources here um, at the bottom and an email to reach us. Okay. So, um, I'm going to I'm going to copy this and I'm going to put it in a chat window um, to everyone. Um, great resource. This is what we all view today. 
um, it links to other information. Um, these links under these images will take you to tips and tricks, um, short, short segment videos, so you can see exactly how to set up a service or how to create one, how to run the tools. Um, this will give you, um, that was not the best thing to click on, let's try this. This will give you insights on um, resources that we weren't able to touch on today. These answer a lot of questions. Um, these links are also great to bookmark. This will show you, um, you know, some of the things we looked at today, but also um, how to interact with the contributor app that we looked at, how to set up services, how to, how to use the data prep tools, how to make deliveries, and just some kind of best practices, really, on how to interact with us. And so, man, I've been talking a lot, and I hope that's okay, but I'm okay if we if we stop, we're at the 12 o'clock mark and I wanna be respectful, but I'm happy to stay on as long as you like. I've got nothing scheduled. If there's any comments um, or questions, Josh, I don't know if you've been fielding anything in the chat window, but uh, I'm open for discussion or not. Um, I, hope, I hope this was in, I hope this was, um, I don't know, impactful in some way. At the very least, I mean, I, I think this has given everyone a, a, a basic working knowledge of, of the program. Many of you may be contributing already, but for those who, who aren't, um, I think this serves as a good overview. Um, I know we spent a little bit more time on the roads than, than maybe we would have liked, but I, it's important uh, to get that information uh, out there and make sure that story is is told because we, you know, we want everyone's expectations to be met. People ask me what I do for a living. I say, I meet expectations. What can I tell you? Um, many of you do the same thing, but <clears throat> uh, information is, is really key to this whole process. And as long as everyone knows what is expected and what can be, what can be accomplished, um, it's a great program. And uh, I'm happy uh, to be a part of it. I've been doing this you know, since the, the program began and uh, all the enhancements and ease of use technology that we've thrown at this have all come from um, our contributors asking us to make things a little bit easier or <clears throat> suggesting different methods or approaches to different things. And we're always listening. And um, I think that's been, you know, people ask me how, I gauge the success of the program. I, you know, I, um, it's hard to say. I don't think it's quantity. I think it's quality. We'd rather work with fewer people, fewer of the right people, um, than a bunch of people who are just throwing stuff at the, at us that may not may <clears throat> be valuable. You know, so, um, yeah, I think that's a wrap for me. Does anybody have anything they want to talk about? Josh, was that okay for you guys? Yeah, no, I think that was great. Oh, good. Yes, yeah, yeah, very good. okay. Um, yeah, this is really. Penny. I've been a contributor for a lot of years. Uh, yes, Penny, I recognize your name. Uh, imagery especially. And then I, I've talked it up at our conferences, and, and, and the question I get is, well, you know, can you do that? Can you uh, give your pictometry them? And I, and I said, well, I asked about it, but uh, they told me they'd get back to me and, and a, a period of time went by and I just said, you know what, we bought this imagery, we're going to go ahead. There's nothing in our contract that says we can't uh, give it away. So, um, Penny, this is a very good thing you brought up because I hear it a lot. Also with data, um, referential content, you saw that that pictrometry was where the AIM stuff came from. Now, what these mm -hmm. third parties may not understand is they say, are you going to give it to well, somebody? I, I told them I'd been doing it and hadn't gotten any blowback, so they started to. <laughs> well, here's the thing. The assumption is made from a third party that, oh, they're making their data available to Esri. Um, first of all, they may be a competitor, and that's, that's our stuff. We worked hard to capture that. They're not downloading the imagery. It's simply a picture. It's nothing more than a foundation that you can see things on. 
There's you know, no way for, to it's just like the satellite imagery that you buy and then you it's the you same thing it for us. You're, you're just, not selling it to us. You're just no, no, no. it just looks better. You know, the community content is what has fueled this whole thing. 60% of the content in Esri's Base Mount Foundations comes from people like you, Penny. That's amazing. That's how important this stuff is. 60%. So for, for me to not have to manipulate that imagery and host it, uh, pay to host it, I can mm. just uh, pass it off to you guys. And then anytime I make uh, a map or an app, uh, in my ArcGIS Online, I've got my own aerial imagery right. that's, uh, you know, a, a step above what uh, what's available in, the, in some of the counties surrounding me that I see more and more of them. Now, yeah. when I zoom in, I can see they've got their their uh, good aerial imagery, too. Yeah, that's a great comment because you're enabling other people to do things. Like if, if Josh wants to begin digitizing large scale content for his campus, you know, his best shot is having a good set of imagery. Now, you know, that's that's huge for, you know, the surrounding community, the broader community. And so and it enables people to do other things. The county of San Luis Obispo started sharing their content or imagery with us last year. And I mean, everyone benefited. Cal Poly was able to build a base map. Uh, the city were able to do things. Um, projects that demand, you know, high resolution imagery were, were able to be supported better. And so it's not just, you know, decreasing labor and infrastructure costs, it's enabling other people, Penny. So, I mean, it, it's a great, it's a great thing to do. That's a great comment. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I thank you for the really thorough presentation. I'm, <laughs> no, well, I hope it wasn't too in the weeds. <clears throat> no. Um, good. Yeah. And we get, we get, we have all levels here. So you, you'd be surprised. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. No, I, I something for everyone. Good. Uh, is there a way to um, suggest any styling changes? Um, particularly looking at uh, trees, since there's only like the seven kinds and yeah. two of those we can't even find here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very good comment, and we hear that a lot with trees. We don't have them all, obviously. You know, we have a lot of species, but yeah, I mean, our cartographers could could help you know entertain our discussion to you know have a different cartographic representation for an elm or or something unique. Certainly, um, yeah, we don't have all of them, but you know, the the vector tile editor may be able to manipulate that or you could create something to to introduce to that. The tile editor is a very good way to change rapidly change, do quick edits for colors and different things like that. Um, I don't think it would allow you to digitize roads because of the reasons we spoke about earlier, but there might be an option in there for manipulating some of the tree styles. But uh, yeah. Um, I can put you in touch with our cartographers who, you know, they kind of make these representation decisions and they, they've heard about it too. I think it's a good conversation. All right. Are there any other questions? Well, if you're the shy type, you can always email me, uh, my email and the, the team emails, um, I'll put my email in the chat window here just just so you have it. I don't think it's on that presentation I showed you, but the community maps alias is on there. And so there's like five or six, seven of us that will will get that. And we always, if there's a question, we'll get it on the alias and we'll decide who is best to uh, address that with our with the user. Well, hey, let me know when this is up. I'll take a look at it. Um, I've been looking at your other sessions and it looks like you guys are, you know, getting some good stuff, interesting topical things that, you know, um, I think, you know, would be interesting to almost anyone in the, in the field. But I uh, appreciate you guys doing this. All right. Well, thank you for, for presenting today.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, anyone, you know, happy to talk with you, um, get in touch with me. Um, you know, this certainly will could lead to questions. Um, there are some tabs that you can quickly hit to go through uh, some of the in interesting things to you. But um, like I said, there's links throughout, um, you know, no shortage of resources out there. So if you don't find the answer within those, um, we're happy to, to help you. All right. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, for uh, anybody else who's left on here, uh, <laughs> we do not have a Lunch and Learn next month due to the ITAG conference. And then we are taking July off for sure. So um, keep a lookout for a possible Lunch and Learn in August. Um, if you have any suggestions, um, please email myself, Josh, and oh, or uh, Micah Cutler, and we'll get it set up. Uh, thanks again, Shane. Hey, take care, everyone. Thank you.